to just welcome all of you and let you know how excited we are and how privileged we are to be able to offer this opportunity for all of you with a gentleman who is an exceptional alum. I'm gonna hold off on that for just a second though before I introduce him and give a special shout out and thank you to Professor Murphy, who actually is the sponsor of this uh, webinar, has had such a outstanding passion, not only for the field of accounting and finance, but also ethics and fraud and is really the key sponsor of this conversation with his classes and so excited to have so many other classes and students able to participate as well. He was very gracious to let everybody share in this opportunity, um, even though he could selfishly would just wanna keep it for himself and his students. So uh, we're excited to have Professor Murphy. He's gonna be our moderator today. And more importantly, we've got a very amazing guest speaker. Uh, Deshaun Hagen is an alumnus of SNU and he's so many other things. And what I wanted to do, uh, Deshaun, is I thought we could start out by letting you not only introduce yourself, but using that as an opportunity to kind of share not only your position now, but really that journey that you took to get there, if that's an okay way to start. You've got an amazing story. And so I'm looking forward to having you share that. Yeah, sorry, one of my employees was just trying to call me. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> that's okay. Hold on. I'm declining the Zoom. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, the way your last 10 seconds I missed. I think you were. You're going to tell us about you. Nothing. You're going to introduce yourself, but I want you to tell them not only about the role that you're in right now, but how you got there, mm -hmm. like the journey that you took. Okay. Because I think that's just so, I think everybody always thinks that people at very high levels must have had a clear path, no interruptions, no hiccups. Everybody just knew what they wanted to do in college. And they just eventually right. landed into a VP role because they moved up a company. And I think your story is just so enthralling uh, and really just, just a, a testament to really what students overall can experience but really out in the real world. So I'd like to turn it over to you. Yeah, so let's uh, start by saying, I hope I live up to, to all that hype that just happened. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> um, and you'll have to excuse my voice, I literally have been talking the entire day. Um, in Q4 meetings. So if I got to go on mute for a second, just excuse me. Um, and the other thing, I'll just kind of set precedence now. If you hear a doorbell ring in the background, I'm breaking Zoom rules here. Some dogs are going to bark, but we have to have somebody come fix something in our, in our kitchen for us. So you'll have to, you'll have to excuse me on that one. Um, but diving right in. So as far as my background, uh, let me give you the uh, the two minute elevator speech here. So uh, leaving high school, I was what you would consider a traditional college student. Uh, went to a state university for a year uh, on an athletic scholarship, had plans on actually going uh, to medical school and being a plastic surgeon. That was what I thought I was gonna do. Um, I had too much fun my freshman year of college. I, uh, I went from a small high school and went to a major university and uh, I think it's still known as kind of a party school. So I fell into that and I needed a, uh, I needed some, some order, some structure in my life. Um, so at that point I decided that I needed to go ahead and make a change. So my family was uh, multiple generations of military, all army. So I thought I would uh, break the mold there and, and join the Marine Corps. So initially joined the Marine Corps to be in the infantry. Uh, because I, you know, the whole, you know, I was 19 and, you know, you couldn't tell me anything and I was, you know, the tough guy and I'm gonna live forever. So I'm gonna go join the Marines and be in the infantry. Um, fate had its way of jumping in there because in boot camp, they were actually screening for what's called the presidential security battalion. So fast forward through all of that and through multiple screenings and, and other things like that, I was selected to actually do presidential security um, in Washington, D.C. Um, so I spent my entire enlistment actually in D.C. Uh, I got to work in the Pentagon, uh, do some things in the White House, got to do a lot of cool things um, with the passing, may he rest in peace of Secretary Powell. Um, I actually got to work with him and was on a protective detail for him. Um, 
personal shameless plug on my end. If you haven't read any of that man's books, do yourself a favor uh, and read some of his books because they, they were game changers for me and a lot of people I know, uh, especially those who are looking to get into leadership roles and things of that nature. So sidebar on that one. Um, after getting out of the military, my plan was I was probably going to go into one of the federal agencies, Secret Service Uniform Division, something along those lines. I ended up coming back to Arizona uh, to take care of some family things and stayed. So that window closed, but then I still had the background and the training to do some um, private contracting security work in different places abroad. So I did that. And on one of my breaks back home, I met my now wife. Um, I made a bet with her because I told her, hey, I'm getting ready to leave again. And uh, I made a bet with her that if she could get me a job interview in the next 24 hours, I would take it just, you know, for the heck of it. So at that point, she had been working at Chase Bank for 10 plus years and had a ton of connections. So not even an hour later, I get an email from a guy that says, hey, your wife reached out to me. I want to talk to you about potentially working at Chase Bank. Keep in mind here that originally I had planned on going into the medical field. But instead, I joined the Marines, was going to go in the infantry, but instead was selected for presidential security, was going to work for federal agencies, but instead ended up private contracting. So there's a theme with my life here, as far as you think you know what you're going to do, and then things change, and you have to adapt and overcome. So I took the interview, and this guy offered me a position as a mortgage banker. And I don't know how little or how much any of you may or may not know about mortgages, but... I didn't know anything about mortgages. I didn't know what points and APRs, any of that other kind of stuff were. So he brought me on um, because I kept the promise to my wife. She wanted me to stay stateside. I was gonna try to make the transition. So I took the job and from there, it ended up being a blessing in disguise uh, because my career took off. Um, worked a little while, probably only about a year as a mortgage banker. And then I was tapped on the shoulder to take some other roles. And then it just kind of kept snowballing for me from there. Um, I was very quick to build my own brand, which is a huge thing for those of you who are already in the corporate sector. I'm not sure if these are undergrads or grads that are, that are primarily dialed in here, but. Mostly um, undergrad. Mostly undergrad. Okay. So if you are working or if you're about to work in the corporate sector, uh, Building your own brand is something that I would say you need to heavily invest in. It's what I did. And I went from a guy who didn't know anything about mortgages to in six years, uh, excuse me, in five years, uh, I was promoted to a, to a VP role. And I've been in my VP role for the past four years. And hopefully I'm in line to move up for me, which would be the I'm done at that point, which is an executive director role. And at that point, I would pretty much be set for my career. So that's kind of my, how I got to where I'm at. Um, to answer the question as it relates to what I currently do. Uh, so currently, I'm a vice president of product delivery slash performance improvement manager. So basically, in my job, I am an area product owner, and I specifically work in the digital fraud space. So I look for ways that the bank is, uh, excuse me, that our customers are losing money, specifically related to digital fraud. So what that means are things that go everywhere from a customer fell victim to a scam, to first party fraud, to the standard you're attempting to do, to do something on the Chase mobile app. And because of certain actions you're trying to take that we need to actually confirm that it's you. Right now I'm driving different initiatives to come up with different ways to authenticate that, hey, this is actually Professor Murphy trying to make this transaction, not someone who got into his account. And that's gonna span the gamut. Um, I can't really get into what we're doing, um, but I can say that it's gonna be things like biometrics and some other, uh, some other things that we're gonna leverage in, in that space. So that is, currently my my world and, and what I do now. Which is really incredible. Thank you for sharing that. I'm going to turn this over to Dan and he's going to start to ask you some questions um, for not only the accounting students, but I think the benefit of all students on this call. 
So Dan, you can take it away. Thank you, Don. I appreciate it very much. And uh, Deshaun, thank you for uh, for joining us this afternoon or this evening in our case. Um, and welcome to Southern Hampshire University's online, um, um, not online program, but online uh, technology. So uh, there's been a few uh, items that we wanted to maybe ask you about. Um, but first, uh, I wanted to give you a, a backdrop on what most of the, what we're trying to accomplish with this particular seminar, and that is um, internal controls, particularly around fraud. And so most of the questions are gonna involve that. Okay. So the, the first question I'd like to ask or to present to you is, uh, how do you view the balance between good uh, internal control versus the benefits that those controls provide? Are we giving up too much freedom in exchange for the protection we get from the loss? So there's a few different ways I could, do you know what the premise of that, there's a few different ways I can take that. So is that basically whoever has asked that question is, is the premise there, the internal controls that we as a, oh, and let me give, me give you this caveat as well. My answering of these questions is purely my perspective. Right. So even though I am a JP Morgan Chase employee, I am by no means speaking on behalf of JP Morgan Chase. So let me just throw that out there. Um, so I'll take, let me answer the question and how I, how I think the person meant to ask it. And if it's incorrect, then we can, we can address it. Sure. Um, but from an internal control standpoint, from what I'm understanding is basically are the controls that we are putting in place kind of infringing upon uh, actions that our customers can and cannot take. Is that kind of where they're going with that? Yep, it could be either customers okay. or, and, and you can think of any large organization, it doesn't have to be specific to Chase, but um, when we think of in, good internal controls, we're thinking of cost benefit. And on the cost side, it's not just the cost of the control, but it's also the freedoms that are given up by certain individuals who have to sacrifice in exchange for the control. So um, the question is more about, are we, uh, how do you balance good internal controls at a, at a organization the size of Chase and those individual freedoms that customers or employees may have to sacrifice and give up in exchange for the controls? Yeah, so from my perspective, it's a matter of, um, I'll just use what I do, for example, if I'm looking at, uh, let's just say there's some new legislation that was passed and it's specific to fraud. And there are certain actions that we have to take as a financial institution. The number one thing that we're always thinking about is the customer, as far as what is the impact to the customer going to be. The majority of financial institutions have specific organizations within those companies that will do customer-based research, whether those are roundtables, whether those are now Zoom calls, et cetera. Most, some of you may have even been reached out for, for this kind of thing. But the number one thing that we're going to do is get customer feedback while at the same time looking at what is it exactly we are trying to achieve. Cost benefit is usually one of the first steps. We have data analytics teams that will break all of that down for us and say, okay, you have for this thing that you want to do, you have this many eligible customers. We're projecting that X amount would probably use it bait based on these factors, or this is how many would be impacted based on these factors. So we go with that. Then obviously it's, well, what is it going to cost us to get this out the door and in front of customers? Are we going to take a proof of concept or an MVP standpoint, or is this going to be the type of thing where, you know, it is some sort of legislation that has passed and we need to spend the next three to six months making sure that we get it right. It's a tight package. And then we roll it out in front of customers. So I would almost kind of say that there's a one for one there, usually, at least how we go about things on our end. Whatever I put out there from an anti-fraud standpoint, I have to take a customer's stance uh, into account every step of the way. It, it could be anything from I'm adding a button that I need Professor Murphy to actually authenticate that it's him. The consideration there is not just, it's that simple, you've added a button. It's how does he get to the button? 
Is it, is he prompted? Does it automatically come up? Once he pushes the button, what happens? How long does that what happened take? What's the good case? What's the bad case? Is there a middle of the road scenario? Is there a timeout? Do we have to make him do it again? So there's a lot of things that come into play. So I would say that, you know, just to answer the question plainly, customer perspective is first, regardless of what it is that we have to do. And we kind of build everything else around that. If that means that we have to spend more money and it's justified, then, then we'll do it. So how do, how do you, how, in, in Chase specific case, how do you determine what type of response customers might have to some of these internal controls? Are there marketing systems that are in place to get feedback and, uh, so we and have, that type of thing? Yeah, so good question. We have teams that will proactively reach out to customers with prototypes. So if you're an existing Chase customer, and this isn't anything groundbreaking, so I'm not sharing anything confidential. If you're an existing Chase customer, you may have, or there may be at some point Chase reaches out to you and says, hey, we'd like your feedback on something. Other, other institutions do it, other um, industries do it. So it's, it's not just financial, it could be tech, auto, et cetera. They want your feedback as it relates to this new product that they're gonna put out there. We do the exact same thing. So we'll take a pool of customers through, hey, this is a new XYZ that we're looking to put within the mobile app. Give us your feedback. Let us walk you through it. And then we'll take that and then apply it to any, any changes that we may make, whether they're customer facing or back end. There may be times that a customer says something that we just didn't even think of. Um, you know, it's kind of that classic, you write a paper, you think it's perfect, somebody else reads it and it's like, yeah, not so much. Um, we, we kind of take that approach to everything to say, let's get our customers eyes on it. Let's get their feedback and then see if that feedback is enough that we can actually apply it to make changes. Again, unless it's some sort of regulatory, then obviously it's not an option. It's, it's going out regardless. Right. Right. Um, I, I, we do have a question about uh, regulation, which maybe is outside of your area of expertise, but if you could um, opine on it, it would still be of interest to the students, I'm sure. So there's a lot of federal legislation revolved around banks and financial institutions. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're curious about the impact of uh, Sarbanes-Oxley on your organization, or maybe even on you personally. Um, and how did that compare to the Dodd-Frank Reform Act of 2010, which really specifically addressed financial institutions? And how much did that change the way you folks do business? And you can answer this question yeah. either from a personal perspective or from a banking industry perspective, but obviously don't tell us things you shouldn't be telling us about Chase. Oh yeah, yeah, no, you don't have to worry about that. I didn't I think so. <laughs> um, so yeah, so Sarbanes-Oxley in a nutshell, um, I'm going to simplify, like really oversimplify it, but unless I'm the CEO of Chase Bank, Sarbanes-Oxley really doesn't impact me. Because uh, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, that's more, so the Sarbanes-Oxley, I'm sure the majority of your people know, but I'll give you the, the two second. Sarbanes-Oxley is to prevent a prime example of companies like, um, what was that, uh, Enron. Enron, yep. Right, so that way it's, if I'm the CEO of a company, I cannot basically claim negligence, or I'm sorry, not negligence, but uh, almost like an incompetence as far as I, I didn't know. I had no clue that my uh, directs were doing this sorts of things and that they were defrauding customers. I'm, I'm up here at the top. I had no way of knowing that. Sarbanes-Oxley basically addresses that by saying, nope, if you're the CEO, you actually, I believe they actually have to wet sign um, financial docs that actually get then submitted to the SEC. So there's no way for our CEO, Jamie Dimon, to say, you know, he didn't know how good or bad we were, we're not doing so. That doesn't impact me as far as anything that I do directly. Mm -hmm. um, Dodd-Frank doesn't really either um, because that is more, I don't want to say it was holistically mortgage, but the mortgage bubble was a big piece of that um, as far as like predatory lending and uh, the big thing was like stated income loans and then putting a customer into an arm. For those that don't know, that's an adjustable rate mortgage. So back then, 
you could have said that you work at McDonald's and make $100,000 a year. The majority of institutions weren't requiring you to actually provide any sort of income documentation. They would stick you into an adjustable rate mortgage so you could afford the first couple years of payments on, let's say, a $500,000 house that you had no business living in. And then all of a sudden the rate changes because it's an adjustable rate mortgage. Um, and then it, you all of a sudden now can't afford the payment. So then now that's one foreclosed house after another. So that was kind of the main piece of that. So from a personal and what I do daily, I'm not really impacted by either. But what I can say is from a institution standpoint, there were a lot of changes, especially Dodd-Frank that were made to our mortgage line of business. Uh, and they still are to ensure that we stay on top of any sort of regulatory changes like that to make sure that we are in adherence. Um, when I was working in mortgage years ago, I helped implement a new mortgage uh, origination system. And it actually took us way longer to get done because we needed to make sure things like Dodd-Frank were addressed before we put it out there to customers. So as far as I'm impacted, not really. Um, but I can say that, yeah, whenever these sorts of, of regulatory things are passed down, it does make institutions stop, hit the brakes, regroup and say, okay, when do we need to have these changes done? And who do we need to get together in order to get these things done? A mm -hmm. couple of questions have come in through the chat that I'd like to uh, address with you, Deshaun, if we can. Yeah. Um, one is from Ryan and he says, can you dive into your comment? before about building your own brand, what's the most efficient way it's done in a well-established corporation? So I think what he's saying is, how do I establish my brand and make sure that it fits into whatever corporation uh, that I might be working in or, or desiring to work in? Yeah, so I would say that the, I kind of took a military approach, which is why I think I was successful. Um, I did not, number one, is I did not get caught up in a lot of the office politics that happen, regardless of where you are. It doesn't matter if you're a professor at a university or an executive at a bank. There's going it is just, it is. What really worked for me was number one, is everyone knew when they interacted with me, they were going to get 100% honesty, whether it was an answer they wanted or not. And that also meant executive leadership. When I was coming up and I had to, and I still do present to executives that are above me, you know, in New York, I, I shoot straight from the hip and I, and I tell them the truth. Uh, because at the end of the day, what I don't want is my name to be associated with, hey, I remember that one guy, Deshaun, he presented something to us. Yeah, all that stuff wasn't right. <laughs> or, you know, he was way out in left field. So even if it's stuff they don't want to hear, one of the best pieces of advice that I got from a mentor that I had, um, <laughs> she always said, and it's kind of ironic given the political times, but she said, report the news as far as give it to people straight and don't, don't try to toe the line. If you do that and you do your job well, people will naturally gravitate to you and ask you to do things for them. There's only been two out of the coming up on 10 years that I've been at Chase. There's only been two actual jobs that I've applied for. The rest of them, people had reached out to me and said, hey, we want to, you know, we want to bring you over to do this thing, that or the other. Because the other thing that you'll realize is when you are in the corporate space, things don't stay aligned, usually very long. Whoever may be your head of XYZ may only be there for another year or two, and then they go do something else. Or your boss may be doing this, and then they go do something else. So building your network is just getting your name out there, performing to a, to a level that you feel is appropriate, and making sure that people understand that when you did something, you did it. I think one of the biggest mistakes that folks make is, um, they are not, I'll be careful how I say this, they're not selfish enough in their own accolades. As far as, you know, you do something, you put it out there, 
but then nobody knows that it was you that did it. So don't be afraid to put your name out there and say, yeah, hey, that thing that you guys reviewed, I put that together, this or that or the other. That was kind of how I started getting the ball rolling. And then once I had people reaching out to me for things, it was based on, hey, I saw the work that you did on this thing. I want to bring you over here. So it's everybody does it different. Um, mine was just being blunt, being honest, and not trying to be the typical corporate guy because I'm, I'm definitely not when I compare my background to my peers, I'm, I'm the polar opposite, but we're all on the same level. So just be your own person and it'll work out. Maybe, maybe you could comment a little bit to, to uh, go into that a little bit further. Um, mm -hmm. Can you let us know how your military background and training prepared you for that branding or did it not matter? Is, are they two different brands? Yeah. Yeah, so it helps me in the sense that um, titles don't impress me. <laughs> uh, I think there's there's a lot of folks that may get stage fright if they say, who is it that asked a question? Was the name Ryan? Or Brian? Uh, yeah, Ryan in this case, yep. Ryan. So let's just say, I don't know what you do for a living, right? But let's just say you're in the corporate space and your boss reaches out to you and says, hey, I, Ryan, I need you to put this thing together in the next 24 hours and you're gonna present it to our executives. Um, I've seen that type of opportunity go completely lost on a lot of folks, where that's your, that is your time to basically shine, to jump out there, get in front of these people, and get yourself known. The other thing that I did is I would approach people. So we, pre-COVID, uh, we always had these big town halls. We had all these other kinds of things that we would do where a lot of our senior executives were there. And I would just go up to them and start a conversation and say, hey, you know, my name's Deshaun. I work in, you know, XYZ. I usually would refer to a name that was probably three levels above me so they would know who I was talking about as far as where I work. And I just started networking. It doesn't mean that I'm asking them for anything. One of the biggest things, and this actually came from my time with Secretary Powell, the bet one of the best pieces of advice he ever gave me was befriend people when you don't need anything. You do that and you for so far down the line because now it's not, oh, well, Deshaun's reaching out to Professor Murphy. We, or, you know, I'm over here shaking his hand and talking to him at this conference because I want something. It's, hey, I'm just shaking your hand and talking to you because I work in your line of business. You're my senior executive. I just wanted to introduce myself, you know, maybe have a conversation with you, share some ideas with you, et cetera, et cetera. I can't tell you how many people do not do that. Yeah. Or the ones that do, they have an agenda. If you do it without an agenda and just for the sake of doing it, you would be surprised how that comes back to you. Do you also, um, do you also feel that it's appropriate and a good idea to understand what it is that the person you're meeting and networking with, what they might need from you presently or in the future as opposed to what you might get from them? Is that a good strategy for networking? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, it also, it just depends on what you're doing and where, you know, right. f for me, it was, I kind of got over titles and being overly impressed by people because <laughs> Because like I was kind of jaded by it when you're 19 and 20 and you're doing motorcades for some of the most powerful men in the U.S. and women, it, you know, you go work right. a corporate job and someone's like, "Yeah, I'm the VP of this." It's like, great. Yeah, <laughs> it's you have two arms and two arms and two legs just like me, right? right? <laughs> exactly. Um, and when you do interact with some of those higher ups, like I did in the military, and you see, they appreciate generic basic conversation the same as everybody else mm -hmm. because they're so used to everybody putting up on putting them on a pedestal that they sometimes miss out on that just that basic interaction of hey you know my name's xyz i'm actually i work for so-and-so who reports to you and you know i just wanted to introduce myself there were times where i did kind of drop seeds as far as uh you know hey i, I do see that you actually own xyz that's something that, you know, down the line, I think I'm, I might be interested in getting involved in, mm -hmm. you know, once I wrap up these other things and nine times out of 10, they gave me someone else's name. Right. As far as, okay, Hey, go connect with this person. We have a question in the chat from Aiden. 
Uh, what is the most common case of fraud you have explored? Is it generally a simple process to detect fraud, fraudulent activity, or is it something much more complex? Okay. So the second half of that, I will, I'll answer that question first and say that it de depending on the type of fraud, it's either easy or it's, it's substantial to try to figure out. Um, because the fraud in general, and I'll just use the entire financial industry, uh, there are the main ones that we see are the phone calls that you all probably get on a daily basis. Um, the car warranty, the uh, Amazon scam, which if you're not familiar with the Amazon scam, that is very familiar. Well, the Amazon scam is basically, I get access to Professor Murphy's, uh, Professor Murphy's credentials, his username and his password, whether I got it on the dark web or I sent him an email and it's monitoring his keystrokes. However I came about it, I have it. I go into his Amazon account and I will look and see what his most re recent purchases were. Um, I will then get Professor Murphy on the phone and pretend I am from Amazon under the guise that I'm calling him about some sort of a, an order issue. And I gain his trust by saying, you know, hey, mo most recently I saw you ordered this, that, and the other. Oh, okay. Well, how else could you know that unless you really are Amazon? Okay. What do you need? Um, and then they get these customers to uh, access third party share sites where they download something and it gives that person access to your monitor, to your mobile device, and then they just proceed to charge away. Um, the Windows scheme is another one that bought, it's the same thing. If you've ever gotten the thing that comes up on your monitor uh, and it says that you've the message is very, you've been attacked, there's suspicious malware, call this number, you call the number and it's a fake call center uh, pretending to be Windows and they ask you to install this stuff and then they charge you and that's a scam. Um, there's more complex scenarios. There's man, what we call man in the middle, which means Professor Murphy and I are criminals and Don is our target. Again, I use the dark web or some other means to get Dawn's financial login credentials to whatever bank she's using. I'll go in and I'll make charges knowing that, and as far as using her card information, knowing that more than likely I may trip some sort of an OTP, which is a one-time passcode. Some of you may have received those on your mobile devices where it says something like, hey, is this you? Um, it comes in different forms. One is is this you trying to make this purchase? Another one is, um, we just want to confirm that this is you uh, attempting to make XYZ transaction. Here's your one-time passcode. The way that it'll work is I'll call Don pretending to be the bank. And I will tell her, hey, it, it looks like there's right now some suspicious activity going on in your account. You should have received a one-time passcode from us can you go ahead and read that to me so I can verify that it's you? She thinks that this is legit, will give me the one-time passcode. At the same time, I will take that passcode and pass it over to Professor Murphy, who was on the phone pretending to be the customer, and he now has the one-time passcode that he's giving to the bank that will allow the transaction to go through. So it, I mean, the digital fraud kind of runs the gamut of scams all the way to very complex um, and how, how they go about doing these things. So when customers call in and say, hey, this wasn't me, there is a specific group that will go in and investigate to see what happened. We don't get involved in those investigations. I just see the outcomes. So then I can kind of look at the metrics to see, are there trends? Are there specific things that seem to be happening more than others? Um, are there certain actions that we need to quickly take within the mobile app or on the browser, et cetera? So de again, depending on the type of fraud, it's either pretty easy to figure out or it gets more complex. There's even a new thing now where uh, they're going after, and this is across institutions, going after customers' rewards points um, because those can be sent out to three, four, five different accounts. and 
there's almost no way to track them after that. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, while we're on the subject of, of cybercrime, another question mm -hmm. for you is, um, what do you consider the most serious cybercrime issue and how do organizations best protect themselves from becoming a victim? So here, I think we're thinking from the perspective of a, of a company or, or an organization or maybe a small business, what's the most serious cybercrime you're aware of and how best do we protect ourselves from it? So across the financial industry, um, the biggest issue as of late has been the one-time passcode, uh, which is why a lot of institutions are going to try to start getting away from it. How long that will take, I don't know. Um, but that is the direction that a lot of them are going. Um, and the reason is, why is, that is the, because... Excuse me, Deshaun, yeah. is that the one-time passcode that we, we get texted to us and we have to input before we right. get in? Yeah. Right, right. So that would be, it's usually a, a numeric sequence because either A, you were trying to do something and whatever you were doing triggered some sort of risk-based rules or you know, something of the like. It's basically a means for that institution to confirm, hey, is this really you that's doing this? That's one of the easiest things, unfortunately, to get out of customers uh, because there are just a lot of trusting people, right? Um, even customers that we know are pretty savvy even fall victim thinking, well, no, I was actually talking to Wells Fargo or Bank of America or Chase, it was you guys no, it wasn't. That was actually, you know, somebody, oh, well, they knew all this stuff about me. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, a lot of that is, is easy to get, uh, especially now social media platforms and everything else. People put a lot of their information out there. So it's not that hard for me to get someone's date of birth, where they were born, uh, their kids' names, et cetera, et cetera. You can mm -hmm. kind of go down the laundry list of forgot password type questions. Mm -hmm. where it's it's pretty easy to figure these kinds of things out and then it's also so relatively easy to get a customer to give that one-time passcode when they shouldn't so there's different things that are being addressed now to try to get that fixed i've seen some institutions capitalize uh we actually just started doing that where if we ever send a one-time passcode to a customer we capitalize the word never to get to let them know we will never ask you for this because <laughs> we never will right um so it's everything from that to figuring out how we can get rid of it but right now that's kind of the big across the industry the one-time passcode giveaway from customers is kind of the big um the big issue okay jack uh, posted a question in the chat uh, and this is going back to your um presentation about networking is it appropriate to ask senior execs and people of that stature for contact information to network later on down the road? So I would say that it depends. Right. Here's why I say that. Um, where I work at Chase, let's just say that um, Professor Murphy was a managing director. So that's two levels above me. So I'm a vice president. The next level above me is executive director. Above that is managing director. Managing directors are usually like the head, like the CEO of a mortgage kind of thing. Um, I can simply look up their contact information internally. So I don't need to ask them for it. Um, so I guess that's why I'm saying it kind of depends. Um, it also depends on, I would say, the outcome of the conversation. Um, if it seems like, you know, if I don't know Professor Murphy from anybody, but I go up and I introduce myself, we kind of start talking, we're interacting, and I kind of think that there's a mutual benefit here as far as like, okay, this may be a secondary conversation down the line at some point. I may ask him for that with the caveat of at some point, not that I'm going to email you or call you every day or whatever, but just putting that out there is like, hey, you know, Professor Murphy, if you wouldn't mind if we could exchange emails and maybe in a couple of weeks or in a couple of months, I can reach out to you and uh, we can re-engage in this conversation. I think that type of thing is fine. But again, it really just depends on the company, what you do, the scenario, et cetera. I'm not going to go ask Jamie Diamond for his cell phone number. So, um, 
you know, I think it's, it, it's all kind of relative. I'm sure you can, you'll be able to feel it out when you get into that scenario. Uh, but if it's somebody that you can just look up internally, I wouldn't ask them for it. But what I would ask is for the permission to use it. Because normally, uh, and this is something I had to learn a while ago, the vast majority of executives have uh, administrators. So they have people going through their email for them and kind of weeding out noise right. and only allowing them to see the stuff that they care about. So one of my mentors, uh, who was a managing director in New York, he had to let his admin know, hey, if, if Deshaun ever you know, tries to reach out to me, kind of let that go through. So you just got to feel the, get an understanding of how the communication is going to work, what your intent is, how the conversation goes. And then I think you can, you'll be able to determine based off that, whether or not it's appropriate. Sure. Okay. Um, I have another question that um, a lot of students have uh, been interested in. Um, digital currency and cryptocurrency is kind of hot and people are really interested in, in how it works and what the future is going to be like with respect to that. I'm sure JP Morgan Chase is right on the cutting edge of, of that kind of activity. So the question is, um, it's an exciting new field for doing business, particularly internationally. What impact has this had on Chase and how has it affected your responsibilities at the firm, if at all? Do you see it as the future of exchanging assets among businesses? Or do you think it'll be a flash in the pan that 10 years from now, we'll hardly even remember it happened? A lot of questions there. Okay. Yeah, if we were to break it down a little bit finer than that. So, so uh, cryptocurrency, how, is it, yeah. how has it affected Chase? Let's start there. Um, so to answer that, I'll answer that from my perspective and say that it hasn't. Um, because you, got, you have to keep in mind that it is, since it is not a federally regulated form of actual currency, um, it's not, I don't want to say that financial institutions don't care about it, but I will say for me, I won't speak for everyone at the bank. I'll just say for me, it feels like more of a watch item as far as let's keep an eye on it and see how this continues to trend. And if it seems like it's going to be something where we as a financial institution are going to have to address it, then I'm sure um, with the ridiculously smart people we have working at this bank, they would be ahead of that. Right. Um, it's not something that I would deal in until it potentially landed in the digital fraud space, which if it actually became a, an actual form of US currency that was regulated and monitored, then obviously by default at some point, it'll land in my space and then you know, we'll go from there. But as of now, it's not something that I have heard a lot of conversations about. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not something that, that impacts me at all as right. of now. Right, okay. And I'm sure Chase is keeping its finger on the pulse of that. Um, it, in terms of your personal opinion, do you think it will be um, a way for companies, you know, B2B, doing business to business and exchanging assets? Do you think it has a future, whether it's regulated or not, or you don't have an opinion or you're not sure? Or, you know, what, what are your feelings about that in terms of exchanging assets? Yeah, so I'll be honest with you and say that I have not really spent a whole lot of time on mm -hmm. Bitcoin or digital currency at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know what its shelf life it's going to be. Um, obviously, I know, I'll say this, that I think that it is a hot and heavy topic because we are a very tech-driven economy, um, especially as generations now, students that are under, you know, high school and undergrads now start to move into the workforce, it's going to be so even more than what it is now, you know, 10 years from now, who knows what is going to be out and how we could be living our lives because of some new big tech thing mm -hmm. that, that just changed the game. Right. So as of now, I, I, and that's why I use the term watch item. That's kind of how I treat it. I, I read up on it every now and again, and I kind of, you know, I have a few close acquaintances that swear by it yeah. and, you know, think that they're going to be millionaires, which, hey, if they are awesome. I right. missed the boat, but right. as of right. now, right. Right. Uh, right. yeah, as of now, I just kind of treat it as something I, I keep an eye on and 
if it seems to get more momentum, then I'll probably pay more attention to it. Okay. And, and last question on, on that particular subject. Um, how long do you think it'll be before it does become a regulated item? No clue. Yeah. Okay. No clue. Because I mean, at the end of the day, what you, in, in that sense, what you have to consider is it will have needed to have gained enough momentum to where legislation is now required. Then it's kind of one of those like, okay, it's, and everything comes in these phases, right? There's a lot of things that, um, I won't address it here, but there's a lot of things that were not legal 10 years ago that all of a sudden gained momentum and they forced legislation and now it is. So, Will, will Bitcoin and cryptocurrency kind of follow that same path? I don't know. Um, I think that our economy is so risk averse because of things like the uh, mid 2000s crisis that there's going to have to be some concrete evidence, for lack of a better term, to show, hey, this deserves legislation now and it should be something that we should be considering as a legitimate form of currency. Mm -hmm. I, and I, don't, I just don't see that they have that yet. Yeah, okay. We uh, have another question um, about uh, internal controls. And I, you know, I understand internal controls themselves is not really part of what your position at, at Chase entails, but I'm sure you're familiar with how companies and organizations mm -hmm. um, you know, use it to make sure they safeguard assets and comply with their internal our procedures and so forth. But so maybe you can answer this question just from a personal perspective. Uh, in considering the warning signs of internal control problems, of which there's been a lot over the last uh, 15 years, what do you think is more important? Warning signs that there is a people problem or warning signs that there is some type of systemic problem? And can you give us any examples of uh, what, you what you might look for in terms of your position as a, as a fraud uh, person. So when we say a people problem, do we mean as in uh, an, earn, an internal issue with employees intentionally attempting to commit fraud or some sort of other? Yes. Like Is the, that where we're going? Okay. Yep, that's where we're going with that question. Yep. Um, so from what I have seen, the internal piece has not been as much it, it's, it's actually not been that much of an issue at all. Um, primarily because, and for those of you that work in corporate sectors, I'm sure you know this, anything and everything that you do on a corporate owned piece of technology is monitored. Whether you think it, it is or it's not, it is. Um, so there are, like we have a organization within Chase called Global Security and Investigations. Um, and those people are ridiculously high speed at the stuff that they can figure out and find and do and track down. It's, it's ridiculous. I'm assuming that the vast majority of other major financial institutions or even Fortune 500 companies have something similar. So from an internal standpoint, I think that is already something that is invested in to ensure that, hey, every, and it's all the basic things, everything from making sure that like you can't print something that you shouldn't be printing or trying to print all the way to instant message conversations, emails, access to certain files, downloading of files, et cetera, et cetera. All of those things are pretty much watched and tracked. So we, from my experience, I have not really seen as much of a employee or an internal issue as I have external and primarily customers falling victim to scams and things of that nature. Um, you mind taking an accounting question on? An accounting question, hold on. <laughs> my, we won't get, what, we won't get too technical. That? <laughs> that class was a couple of years ago, but I'll try it. <laughs> we won't get too technical on you, but um, I, I'm thinking more in terms of, you know, some of these students are in an accounting class and, and what we mm -hmm. study often and what we've tried to highlight as much as possible is 
the financial statements as as they're presented, their their matrices. You know, we're trying to measure yeah. something. We're trying to report back information. It's it's a communication device. It's not just you know, a piece of paper. Um, mm -hmm. If you could pick just one accounting financial measure as the most important metric from which to judge a company, what would that metric be? <laughs> oh, wow. Told you it'd be non-technical, right? That's a, that's a definition of a loaded question though. Um, <laughs> so I, I, would, I would say this, um, the main, and again, I'll answer this just on my end. Mm -hmm. I am all about the digital fraud and the fraud space. So my, on a regular basis, what I look at um, and what our executives look at, um, as far as executives above me, are fraud losses. How much money are we losing as it relates to fraud? Why would I care about that as a customer? If I'm giving a bank my hard-earned money, whether it's my 401k, my say, whatever it is, if I'm giving you access to my assets and I know that you are losing what I would consider to be substantial amounts of money, either every month, every quarter, or every year, I would have concerns about what controls you do have in place and why it seems like, for lack of a better term, that bleeding hasn't stopped or slowed down. So I only say that because that's the space that I live in. And for us, it is a very telling number, um, depending on how you're, how you're looking at it. So that's kind of where I would focus is how much money is the bank, lo uh, any, institu any institution, excuse me, losing from a fraud standpoint, um, because that in and of itself will tell you whether they do or don't care about you as a customer or internal controls or internal policing or regulatory, any of that other kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. It looks like we have about five more minutes or so left in the, in the program. Um, I would, I'd like to do, if anybody has any last minute questions they want to post to the chat, please do so. But if I could, Deshaun, two questions that I'd like to pose. And if we have more time, we'll take more. But, but one student, Lindsay asked, what are some of the skills that you feel helped your success in a business like Morgan Chase? And how can undergrads like us further our education in the field? Uh, where sh what should we study and where should we start? So I can tell you this, um, undergraduate studies are not what they used to be 15, 20 years ago. Oh, come what? on, Deshaun, you're killing me. Here's, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Here's what I mean by that, not a degree itself. I'm talking about what you majored in. So I have worked with, case in point, I have a peer who has a BA and a master's in forensic psychology. She's working in banking. But if you know that you want to go down this path as it relates to, I want to work in the financial industry, I would say focus your, if you know that it's going to be something very specific, like if you know, oh, I want to do forensic accounting, that is a very specific field, right? Which is going to require specific types of knowledge in order to do. But if you know that you want to go into business in general, or I want to work in the corporate sector, my bachelor's degree is in cybercrime. That helped me get in the door um, as far as over to the digital fraud space. Um, but I have a standard MBA. I don't have any specialization. I just wanted to further my education from the business side so I could kind of better compete, number one, but then also have a additional knowledge specific to business in general like what are the things that senior executives think about what are the you know how do i do this how do i do that and that's why i pursued my mba having a degree is obviously almost a required right but i think after that is you really don't have to decide what you want to do when you grow up until you actually get your foot in the door 
because by no stretch of the imagination, when I started working at Chase doing mortgages, did I think that five years later I'd be a, be a VP and then years after that I'd be owning digital fraud products. Never would have thought that. But that's where kind of my career progression took me. So I would say leave, leave as many doors open as you can. Don't, you know, pigeonhole yourself into one specific thing that may limit you once you do get your foot in the door and they say, well, your education is only in this. How does that apply? So I would just say leave, leave the doors wide open. And after you finish your undergrad and you get into the corporate sector, or if you already are in the corporate sector, leverage that to either make a move or however you want to leverage it. And then if you choose to continue postgraduate at that point, it's a lot easier for you to narrow your scope and say, okay, you know, Hey, I got into the door at this bank. I want to do, I want to be an anti-money laundering investigator. Okay. Now, you know, at that point, what, uh, you know, go get your CFE, your certified fraud examiner, go get your, I think there's a money laundering certification. There's all these different things that you can get at that point. So best piece of advice I would give you is just finish the path that you're on now, as far as your undergrad, regardless of your major, get your foot in the door somewhere. And then once you do that, that is when you leverage post-secondary and credentials to then really get you where you want to go. Because the other thing is just because you have an undergrad, or excuse me, just because you have, let's just say a master's, but you don't have a lot of corporate experience. That's kind of what your, you know, a way to think about it is, okay, do I just go straight in and knock out a post-grad just to say that you have it or navigate the waters a little bit, see if this is really something that you want to do. And if it is, then you can make this tactical decision and go, okay, now I know I want to go get these other credentials and I want to go do this, you know, this other thing. Like right now for me, my wife has made me put a pause on any postgraduate continuance at this point um, because I eventually want to move on to complete a DBA or something similar, potentially another, you know, a doctorate in management or something along those lines. It's not really going to benefit me at Chase, but at the end of the day, I think it's going to give me that greater depth of knowledge. It's going to let me do my job better, but it's also going to allow me across the board to be more strategic and tactical as far as you know, what I want to do within the bank or even down the line. So, yeah, I would say take your time. Take your time. Be smart. Don't be in a rush. And then make your decisions once you have actually decided the road that you want to go. Mm -hmm. That's really terrific advice, Deshaun. Thank you. Um, and I think we're pretty much out of time. Um, I do want to thank you, Deshaun, for all the insight that you've provided to us. And um, we really appreciate the time you've taken with us. Um, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Don. And Don, if you uh, would like to um, wrap it up for us, I'd appreciate it. Okay. Yes, I, I, I second that in terms of thanking you, Deshaun, for your time. You mentioned being in Q4 budgeting, which is a, a truly, I'm sure, quite a nightmare. And yet you took time out to meet with all the students, which we're really grateful for. And I'm really hoping that um, we end up with a bunch of other questions. I know there were some other folks that somebody had their hand up. If we gather some additional questions and we just want some insight from you, I'm hoping maybe we can just uh, send that over. But ultimately, we just want to say how grateful we are for your time, your wisdom, and, uh, and we're willing to come back and talk to some students and share your world knowledge because it's just it's you know you're out there and it's a good thing they're all going to be out there at some point so thank you so much yeah yeah no worries um if any of you want feel free to reach out to me on on linkedin you can send me a um an invite and uh if you have questions um related to this then uh or you know business or whatever and you you want to shoot me that over that that's that's no issue at all. So I'm easy to find on LinkedIn. I think I'm the only Deshaun Hagen. So <laughs> I win as far as marketing goes on that. That sounds awesome. I may actually take this clip at the end because I, I teach a class where networking and LinkedIn are critical. And here you are saying how they are because that's how you get in touch with you. So no, they they are, especially in today's economy. It's yeah. 
I regularly have reached out. So that's the last thing I'll say. I know we're two minutes over, but if you don't have a LinkedIn, go create one. Um, it doesn't matter if it's basic or generic, who cares? Um, get that started because the more you add to it, the more people see it, the more, I mean, it's, it's just going to help you down the line to where, you know, I'm fortunate and blessed and lucky enough to where I have recruiters and other folks reaching out to me regularly saying, Hey, you know, you want to come over here? Do you want to go, do you want to go do this? Do you want to go do that? And it, it's all just off looking at the LinkedIn. So if you don't have one, create it. Doesn't matter if there's only one line on there, who cares? Get it, at least get it out there and get it going. Um, that way as you can add more stuff to it, more people will see it and yeah. That's wonderful. Oh, thank you so much. I will follow up with you and thanks to everybody for today. And I hope you all have a great night. Thank you all. Appreciate the time. Good Bye. night.